Thank you very much for having me again. Um, pleased to know I didn't do too much wrong last time, just to get, get myself uninvited. But thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to start by reading in John chapter 8 and verse 1 to 10. John chapter 8 and verse 1 to 10. And before I do that, I'll just say that we all we all make mistakes. Is something that I'd written at the top of my sheet. We all make mistakes, and I've said before that sin is sometimes considered, or I would think of it in my mind, as something in our lives. It's a bit like an iceberg where there's a water line, and the water line is just what's accepted. It's that everything above that's what's well. Nobody's perfect. That sort of mentality of well, everyone's not quite perfect so that's maybe getting annoyed at someone having a short fuse or speeding in your car if you're late for somewhere or not giving someone the care that they need maybe being a wee bit selfish sometimes that's maybe just above the waterline things that you acknowledge that do happen and then the biggest part of sin in our lives is the stuff that we would be ashamed of stuff that we'd be embarrassed about that we wouldn't share with anyone um, unless maybe it involved someone and that's stuff that we can confess uh, before God uh, when we come to salvation just today I made a mistake started last night I'm going to tell you about that mistake but it has affected tonight and I'll tell you why so last night I was near bedtime Anne Louise had just headed down to the bathroom and she heard a lot of noise in the kitchen and there was me in full flow doing whatever it is that I'm acting out here, I don't know, but I was in the kitchen and I was making a trifle. And I had suddenly decided at about half 10 or 11 o'clock last night that I was going to make a strawberry trifle. So I thought, I fancy trifle tomorrow, and jelly takes a long time to set. So last thing I started melting this jelly and getting it all ready, 250 ml of hot water and melt everything down, add my cold water put it in the fridge with all the wee trifle sponges and strawberries in it, ready to go. Just needed angel delight and custard added this morning. Easy peasy. And Louise going, what? What are you making a trifle for last thing before bed? Sure, I'm not here tomorrow. I'm at my mum's for lunch to give you peace. And I thought, perfect. <laughs> so there's quite a lot of trifle up at the front tonight. There's not much to go home to, but... We all make these little mistakes and sometimes we make bad decisions, but that wasn't that bad. We obviously make far worse ones. Now in John chapter 8, we read of a woman, and this woman who has been caught and been brought before the Lord Jesus, we read here in verse 2, early in the morning, um, he came again into the temple and all the people came on to him and he sat down and he taught them and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. What sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have a reason to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote in the ground, as though he heard them not, just ignoring them. So he continued asking. Uh, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up, and he said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And he stooped down again and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, this being the, the scribes and the Pharisees, uh, being convicted by their own conscience, they went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst I think that's interesting that when Jesus asked them to leave if they had any sin he still remained with this woman so Jesus lifted himself up and saw none but the woman and he said unto her woman where are those that accused thee or where are thine accusers hath no man condemned thee and she said no man lord and Jesus said unto her, unto her, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. So neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Now if we went across to John 3 and 17, we would read that God came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 
It's God's purpose that through his son he would provide for us salvation. A way that without condemnation he could still justly forgive us our sins and take us to heaven someday through his son. And he did that, as we know, through Calvary, the place of the cross where the Lord became sin for us, where he laid down his life for us. And becoming sin and paying for sin, he's now just and right and therefore righteous to forgive us our sins, having those sins already been paid for by himself. And that's what we see here. So we're in the New Testament here, and we can see that the people of the old way, the scribes and the Pharisees, come trying to catch the Lord out, and he shows them that they will have no reason to have any complaint. In fact, they have to leave um, as he takes them through this, and he shows them that it will be a personal relationship that this woman needs with him. He is sinless, and he could have thrown the first stone, and he remained when he told everyone to leave who had sinned, and yet he says, neither do I condemn thee. So if you're here tonight, and there's any sin in your past, whatever it might be, something that you feel God would be angry about, and that you know you would fall short of his standard, God is prepared to forgive. So that's something from the New Testament that shows the personal relationship that God, through his Son, wants to have with us, though we're sinners, to make us right for his kingdom, to make us right for heaven. And now I want to take you to the Old Testament to show you maybe more for, well, it's often read in terms of those who are saved in Jeremiah chapter 18. But it's useful for um, saved and unsaved alike. And just before we read there, I don't know if anyone here went to Glastry School when they were growing up. I know some of the main protagonists who would be normally here tonight aren't here tonight, and they did go to Glastry. But anyway, I went to Glastry. I don't know that I learnt a whole pile. But when I was in Glastry, and you go through the front doors, and you went down past the English sort of block inside the courtyard there, you went past the English teachers, PE, and then English. And then you turned right, and you went past home economics. All those subjects just... Absolute rubbish to me. You know, could just about make a paper aeroplane in English, and I still don't know where a semicolon goes. But went past home economics, and I can remember totally wrong now when you think back that you believed that the home economics teachers were really dirty, and you forgot that as a boy of like ten, you know, your scones had been on the floor a few times before you brought them home, and um, there was as many raisins on the far windowsill as in your ingredients anymore, you know, but. You came down, then you hit some proper subjects like science, and you head up the stairs, and you had a wee history. It was a good subject too, you know, so long as it's not made up. It was good. And then you had maths. Maths was real easy, wasn't it? You know, 2 plus 2 is 4, and 2 plus 3 is 5, and you got all those sort of answers right, and you didn't understand how people got them wrong. It was brilliant. But then just round the corner, if you know Glastry, so you had Mr. Crummy. There's people here probably taught by Mr. Crummy. I can see some nods. I was taught by Mr. Crummy. So was my dad. Isn't that amazing? So I got the last few of his years as he taught me. And Mr. Irwin in English, some taught by him too. But in art, there was this arty farty corner. I don't know what it was doing. It was in amongst all those proper subjects. And then there was art. Another subject where you could get like an E or an F just because someone didn't like what you'd done. You know, wasn't right, wasn't wrong. Just they didn't like it, you know. That was Mr. Bennett. Okay. So Mr. Bennett, he, I got his last year, wore, wore his wee clogs around the classroom, proper old school weirdo. So <laughs> Mr. Bennett was brilliant, but Mr. Bennett got us to do pottery. And, you know, if you were really wick, you got to roll out your clay and then cut it into wee squares and make a box. So that's what I did. Other people who were maybe a wee bit more talented would get taken over to the special people's corner where there was maybe a wee wheel and they got to you know make things but anyway that brings us on to where we are here I was useless at that absolutely but most of my works were fit to be folded up in fact they probably looked like I had purposely destroyed them when I was finished with them but here we come to Jeremiah chapter 18 and we read there that the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying arise and go down to the potter's house and there I will cause thee to hear my words and I went down to the potter's house and behold he wrought a work. He was working it at a piece of, of, of clay on the wheel. And the vessel he made of the clay was marred. It became damaged. It wasn't perfect in the hand of the potter. 
so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make. And then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand. Now, the rest of that chapter goes on to explain how the Lord and all his foreknowledge knew that even though the people of Israel, God's people, like us today, God wants to know us. He wants to have a relationship with us. And the people of Israel in that day had turned their back on God. They were worshipping idols, all sorts of things. There was incense and fire offerings and oil offerings on rooftops and all sorts of strange things that were happening. happening. And it says here that they did an evil in his sight. God in his foreknowledge said, To Jeremiah, he said, Return thee now, every one, from his evil way, verse uh, 11, that is, um, and make your way from his, return from your evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. And they said, This is, and God knew what they would say, said, There is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices. We will, everyone, do the imagination of his own evil heart. So God knew what the people were going to do. Jeremiah is then told, go again, this is chapter 19, Jeremiah says, go and get a potter's earthen bottle, something that has been made, something that is hardened, and take the scribes and these priests out into this uh, valley. And then jumping down to verse 10, he says, then break thou the bottle in the sight of the men that go with, with thee, and say unto them of this broken pottery, he says, say unto them, even so will I break thee, or this people and this city, as one breaketh a potter's vessel that cannot be made whole again, and they shall bury these parts. Now, this potter is speaking. God is saying that he would like to do with the people of Israel as the potter does with the clay. Where there's a problem, a blemish, a sin, an issue, he would like to make it afresh, start anew, give you a new start, a new heart. And he's saying, but I know that for most, it wouldn't matter. They don't want to be as the clay in the potter's hand. They don't want to be molded and changed. They want to do whatever suits their fancy. And he even goes as far as saying that in their minds, they'll say it's hopeless. Maybe in your mind, it seems hopeless to change, to come and believe things that you disagree with or to change your heart from sinning but it's definitely always been God's plan that he would have a relationship with man he wants to have a relationship with you and through his son he's made a way that without sacrifice and without uh, blood being shed and without all of these uh, keeping of every single law God has made a way through his son that he can justly and righteously bring you into his presence and into his father's home one day and give you forgiveness of sins for his son has paid for it all on the cross at Calvary. You know, this comes with a warning as well. That's why Jeremiah was to go out into the desert with the clay. Once it's finished, once it's set, nothing can be changed. And he was to take that earthen vessel and smash it before the people, before these leaders of the people. And show them that the same way that this is broken, that's going to be the end of Israel. It's going to be destroyed in such a way it cannot be put together. And that's the same for us in our lives. While we're in the potter's hand, anything's possible. While we're on the wheel, while we're alive in life, repentance is still an option. It's something that's offered to us, a way back to God from whatever our path might be. But there comes a time, and the warning is that there is a time when it's too late. There's a time when our our hearts are so hardened that they won't change. And there's certainly a time when our life ends that it's too late to make any change. Now, repentance, I suppose, you can think of in two ways. One is that we must turn our back, not on the sin that we're ashamed of and pretend it doesn't exist, No, turn our back on the sin that we enjoy. Turn our our back on the sin that we enjoy and repent of that sin, to be sorry for that sin, to plan to do it no more, and also to seek forgiveness for all the wrong things that we have done. 
So it's not to ignore our sin or to hope everything's going to be okay. We do find, I do find that, don't mean to be critical. You do find that sometimes when you listen and speak to Christian people um, who, who believe certain things and they certainly believe that God is, you really wonder sometimes, have people got it wrong? Do they just believe that having some sort of faith that there is a God, that that counts them in any stead before him? When even we're told that the devil and his angels know that there's a God, they believe that there's a God there in no doubt whatsoever, and their eternal destiny is the lake of fire. So it's not just to know that there is a God, it's not just to know that he exists, it's not just to call upon the name of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, in Mark 1 and 15, he says, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. He challenges people to change the path that they're on, to follow him and believe in him. This woman who was told that he didn't condemn her, he then goes on to say, go and sin no more. There needed to be a turning away from her ways and to turn to him. Now, it's not always easy, I guess, we always have a natural inclination. It would be nice to do some wee good thing that would stand us in good stead, wouldn't it? If we could just do one wee thing that would make everything all right. Sometimes if you've offended someone, it would be easier if you could just give them a wee Christmas card at Christmas and they would forget about it. It's harder to go and say sorry. Sometimes if you need to lose some weight. It's much easier to join a gym or much easier to count your steps than it is to actually cut out the bad food. You know, getting to the root of the problem isn't natural for us at all. If your if you're spurious spending ruins your bank account, it's maybe easier to say, I maybe need to change jobs here. I might need to train myself a bit better, or maybe I need to take on some extra shifts or hours. It's harder to actually solve the problem. So we need to look at the root cause of our sin. It's something that indwells us, that's been in us from we were born. It's easy to see when it's a little child no matter who the child is, they'll be selfish. It's me, me, me. From They're not even able to speak. It's, ah, feed me, get me what I want right now. And we don't really change. We just get really good at kind of hiding it as we get older, that it's all about me. But we need to see that God has given his son. And whilst we cannot be perfect, his son is perfect. And through the perfect person of the Lord Jesus Christ, if our faith is in him, and not in ourselves, then we have hope for eternal salvation. That's the truth of the message of the gospel. Like the potter in the Old Testament where there was molding, there was a marred um, vessel, there was something that was destroyed. Each one of us, in our own way, through sin, are imperfect. And someday God will have to fold up all his efforts with us, if we haven't given in to his way and allowed him to make us perfect, someday he will fold that up and it will be gone forever, banished from his presence, never to be with him for all eternity. It's called eternal death or the lake of fire and hell. But if we give in to God, if we return and give him thanks for all that he has done for us, he promises not only that he'll forgive us, but that he'll receive us into his presence someday. So I'm just going to finish there. It's 5-2. The Old Testament tells us that God has been the same from way back then to right up to date. God has had an interest in man in changing us so that we're acceptable in his sight. And he still has that interest now. We see the woman who's caught in adultery. We see her brought before by a whole uh, a group of men who were considered the legal people of that time. And they were going to find her guilty. But in Christ, she finds she's not actually condemned. She's free, not to sin, but free to sin no more when she's met with the Saviour. That can be your experience too. We'll just close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before thee in our Saviour's name, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for these words from your word. And we just pray that they'll strike a chord with someone's heart tonight, that someone will know um, your Son as their Saviour. We pray for all of us who are saved that will be encouraged, reminded that you are always there. We're in your hand at all times, like the clay's in the potter's hand, and that you're prepared to make us new. We pray we'll keep short accounts with thee and with our sin, and we'll confess it and be made new in your sight, be righteous 
through your Son. All these things we pray in our Saviour's name. Amen.